God help us as the people of God to rise up one more time and call out to the Lord and say enough of this. I don't know about you, but I'm sick at heart at looking at drag queens reading stories to our children in, in kindergarten. God help us to recognize the evil of this moment. And when we begin to cry, something happens in the heart of God. When we were having communion today, I heard a lady cry in the sanctuary and immediately my heart went out to you because I sense that that cry is a cry of pain. It's a cry of sorrow. It's a cry of saying, oh God, oh God, I want to believe that you're gonna take me through this struggle and through this trial. And immediately I found my heart going out to that cry. How much more does the heart of God not explode with a desire to show himself powerful and compassionate again when you and I begin to cry out to him, when his people cry? God's heart is a hundred billion, billion times greater than mine. And if my heart can be drawn out by a cry, can you imagine when the cry of God's people begin to come into his ears? Help us to pray. Help us to care. Help us to get out of our stupor. Help us as the people of God to recognize that we still have access to the throne of God who created the heavens and the earth. Help us to recognize one more time that we have power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Help us to escape living lives of trying to preserve ourselves and help us to fight for our sons and fight for our daughters, fight for our families, fight for our children. And ultimately, and more so than the rest, to fight for the testimony of the glory of God in this generation. That's what made David a, a warrior. That's why he could take on and defeat a giant. It wasn't just about surviving and being famous or preserving himself. I see young David walking through the camp and says, how come nobody's fighting this loudmouth giant that's threatening to take the armies of God into captivity? This is about the honor of God. That's what David said. This is about God's honor. This is about the word of God. It's about the power of God. It's about the mercy of God. It's about the warrior heart of God. In Exodus 3, the Lord said to Moses, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God's saying to Moses, I'm not distant from their struggles. I'm not far away vacationing somewhere, and, and a rumor, a report of their cries come to me. I've heard it. I'm familiar with it. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. In other words, somebody else is where you're supposed to be. Some power of darkness is occupying the place where you're going to bring glory to God. God says, I've heard your cry. I'm going to raise you up and you're going to drive every last one of them out of that place. And you are going to become, you're going to become the man. You're going to become the woman. You're going to become the person that I've called you to be. Now, therefore, behold, verse nine, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, when they cried, what happened is God, one more time, was about to show them the way back to victory. Remember, it's not by might. It's not by power. It's not by our strategies. It's not by our successes. It's not by our resumes. It's not by our high profile preachers or anything like that. It's by the spirit of almighty God that this victory is going to be won. That's why I am convinced that this last day awakening is going to be the whole church and not just a select few people. The whole church is going to rise up. Men like you and me, women are going to rise up and say, God, I want to glorify you in the earth. 
I want my life to count. I'm sick of being under the voice and the influence of taskmasters set to keep me in captivity, sent to keep me from becoming everything that God's called me to be. I'm tired of this and I'm calling out to you, Lord, and I'm asking you to do what only you can do. His strength begins when our strength ends. When we have come to the place of recognizing without you, Lord, I go nowhere. Without you, I become nothing. Without you, nothing is going to happen. Without you, nothing is going to last. Every effort I make will just imagine any one of these children of Israel at that time rising up and trying to take on the Egyptian army without weaponry, with no strength in the position they were in. But listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you and my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will most gladly boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul discovered this key. And then Paul is essentially saying in 2 Corinthians, God, preserve me from becoming strong in myself. Save me, God, from rising up with my own plans. Keep me in this place of dependency and weakness and reliance on you because it is in this place that your strength is made known in my life. And so for those that are here today and you feel weak, you wonder, can God ever use me? Can my life ever amount? to anything. I'm telling you in that place of weakness, when you call out to God, your life will become everything that God has intended it to be. There is no mountain too high for you to climb. There's no wall too thick. There's no valley too deep. There's no river too far to cross. When God finds an honest heart, when God finds somebody like you and I that knows our weakness, knows that we have a battle ahead of us that we're never going to win in our own strength, there's no chance and we start calling out to him, then history repeats itself again. The question is, I suppose, do we believe it? Do we actually believe this? Do we still believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Or is the Bible just a history book to us? Are we going to just read it and clap our hands at what God did for Moses and David and the children of Israel and never live it in our generation? Are, are we going to let our children be taken captive, killed, thrown in the river? Our families destroyed? Are we going to continue to let evil be called good and good be called evil? Are we going to let the unrighteous, in a sense, rise up and begin to dominate our future and further marginalize and further oppress the people of God? Or are we going to start to pray as David did? And when we start to pray, God starts to speak. When God starts to speak, we start moving with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit starts moving, it's like a hurricane on steroids. There's nothing can stand in its way. Nothing, nothing. I've lived it. I've seen it. I've known it. And it's given me courage for this season in my life. I'm 66 years old this month. It's a time when, when most horses should be put out to pasture. But I feel like I got another race left in me. I really do with all my heart. <laughs> Lord, the psalmist, and one of the psalmists says, oh God, don't take your spirit from me until I've shown this next generation your power. Not talk to them about it until I've shown it to them. That you are a God who take, you delight to take the weak. You delight to take those things that are nothing in this world to bring to nothing things that stand in their pride and arrogance against the hand of God. The instructions that were given to the people of God of this time is very similar to the instructions that God would give to you and I, and you'll find them in Exodus chapter 12. Now, he was doing all of the work. I want you to understand this. He was doing all of the work. The, the plagues that were coming down to cause uh, this nation, this godless nation, to let the people of God go were all the hand of God. God was doing it all. The people had no part in this. They, they're still out there just hauling, trying to make bricks and doing their thing. And so God sends through Moses an instruction to the people. And here's what he tells them to do in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, 
Every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make uh, your count for the lamb. In other words, you have to start eating of the lamb in your own house. That means you and I have to get into the word of God. Jesus Christ is the lamb of God. He is the bread of life. He himself said to his own disciples, if you don't eat of my, of my flesh, he said, if you don't eat a partake of what the victory I'm winning for you, you'll have no life in you. So our choice is to get back into the word of God in our homes. Don't rely on tapes. Don't rely on somebody else's revelation, some old time messages somewhere. Get into the Bible yourself. Start reading the Bible. If you have a hard time to read, ask God to give you the ability to read. You can get the Bible on tape. You can put it on headphones or an earplug or anything, whatever, and listen to it. But get into the Word of God. The next thing that we're told to do is reach out to your neighbors. Don't, if you have too much, share with somebody who doesn't have anything. Reach out to your neighbors. You, you, you can start, when you start getting into the Word of God, you'll find a supply. You'll find promises. You'll find vision and hope for the future. It'll begin to overflow. And so do what God told these people to do, is reach out to somebody who has nothing and invite them into your fellowship. Set yourself apart for God. Don't live in mixture any longer. Don't live with one foot in the church world and one foot outside of the church. Choose this day whom you will serve. Not only start eating of the lamb, get the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house. And say, I don't know if Joshua said to the people one day, he said, if it be too hard for you to serve the Lord, then choose who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Get the blood on the doorpost of your house and say, God set me apart. God, sanctify my thinking. Establish my direction. Establish my going. And then after that, he says, then eat the flesh on the night. In a sense, you're going to be delivered. With unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. In other words, leaven always speaks of hypocrisy. Eat the word of God without hypocrisy. And eat the bitter with the sweet. Eat the things you like and eat the things you don't like. So don't just become one of these pocket promise people. Do you understand? Read the whole Bible. Read it. Read the things you want to read and read the things you don't want to read. The things that make you feel sweet and the things that make you cringe. The things, he said, eat the whole thing. Remember, get the lamb in your house. Start eating of the lamb. Get the blood on the doorposts. Eat it without hypocrisy. Eat the bitter with the sweet. And verse 11, he says, And thus shall you eat it with your belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. In other words, if you're going to do this, get ready for a journey. Get ready. I can see the dads in their houses that night. Papa, where are we going? I don't know. But I have a feeling if we have to go through the wilderness, God will feed us there and keep us. If we got to... If we got to run, flee from armies, God will drown them behind us. If we got to go through rivers, God will part them before us. He said, I'm taking you to a place that belongs to you, a place I've ordained for you, and I'm going to give you power. And you're going to be able to conquer all of it by the presence of God that's going to go with you. And so I want to challenge you. If you're going to do these things, folks, get your shoes on because we're going on a journey. Your life is going to change. Your future is not going to be like your past. You're going to live a life that brings glory to God. You're going to have a breakthrough. And you're not just going to sing about it. You're going to live it. We are being called of God as the church of Jesus Christ in this nation to rise up and take a God-appointed journey. We are. I feel in my heart like Moses must have felt. He walked in the camp in weakness and he had no nothing around him that would indicate that there was any power to do the things that 
he was telling them they were going to do, except that he could say, God has spoken to me. And I can honestly stand here today with no apology and tell you that God has spoken to me. He's spoken to me since I was in my 20s about a day coming of hardship in the nation, but a day when there would be a sweep of God bringing people into his kingdom. The numbers would be uncountable that I would live to see. He spoke to me about a great awakening before I knew what that was. He's spoken to me all my life, and I feel like this old horse has been prepared for this race. I really do, with all my heart. And so, how many here would like to escape the taskmasters? That's what Moses had to ask the people. I'm, I'm not Moses, but he had to ask the people. How many would like to escape the taskmasters? And with one accord, with one accord, the people said, okay, we're in. 400 years of captivity, 400 years of bondage, marginalized, told that they're nothing, beaten, laughed at, scorned, mocked, but suddenly they rose up. All the week of, the, of that time, they rose up. Something of God's spirit got a hold of them, and they rose up and said, I'm going with God. I'm going with God. I'd rather die in the desert than live in this place. I'm going with God. The fervency of these people was such that even the mixed multitude in Egypt, many came with them. People who never knew the God of Israel got up and left with them. May it be. May it be that many, many people in this generation get up and go with us in the days ahead. What a great day to be alive. This is a marvelous day to be alive. He's going to start fighting your enemies. You don't have to fight them. He'll fight them. You do what you're supposed to do, and he will do what he's supposed to do. And you watch what God will do. You watch the strength that will come into your life, the vision come into your eyes, the compassion into your heart, the sense of authority he will give you as a believer, the will to fight, not just for yourself, but for others now. You watch what God will do. So, Father, I thank you that you have given me the ability to bring this message to your people. I thank you, Lord, with all my heart, God, that you're going to do something so far beyond us in this generation that we will stand back one day and say, only God could have done this. Only God could have done this. We will sing that song that the children of Israel did sing on the other side of the Red Sea. So I thank you with all my heart, God, for men and women young and old, who will get up and run this race that you've set before us now, to be a people who bring glory to your name in the earth and make a difference for this generation. I thank you, Lord, that it will be so beyond us that we can only stare behind and wonder and say, God, now I see where you were taking me. And so I thank you for it with all of my heart, in Jesus' name.